this is the outline for the class. Today we're going to do a general introduction to apologetics. Um, and what I do in the introduction is kind of just hit the high points. A lot of these, uh, you're going to feel like I didn't give you a complete explanation of something. That's because that's what this whole course is about. We'll get into more detail later. But today I will both give you an introduction to some of the key terms, and we'll also talk about some of the key concepts and uh, like types of apologetics, because there are a lot of different kinds of specialties within apologetics. So first we'll talk about what it is, and then some details. Next week, my intention is to talk about the reliability of the witnesses. That means scripture, the people, the church. Uh, weeks three and four, we will talk about apologetic approaches to the existence of God. And we'll spend two weeks on that. It's one of the, especially because of the growth of science and what science has taught us and some of the mysteries that it not only has, has answered but, un, but created, unfolded. Um, and some of you belong to our church or attend our church. Some of these are some of the things I'm, I'm preaching on right now because I'm doing a series called Why We Believe. Last week I talked about why we believe the Bible. Uh, and so when we get into the witnesses, I, some of that material you'll be hearing a second time, which is good because then you'll remember it better. Uh, one of my professors in seminary said the most important chair in any seminary should be the professor of the repetitious and redundant. <laughs> because most of the really important stuff you may have heard before, or probably have heard before, but you need to be reminded of it, so that'll be good. Um, the fifth week we'll talk about creation, prophecy, and miracles. Some people, including C.S. Lewis, say that the existence of the miracles as testified in Scripture, as well as in the life of the church, are a real evidence for the existence of God. Then, the risen Christ, having to do not only with the evidence for Jesus as a historical person, and nobody with any sense, nobody with any sense, challenges the historical existence of Jesus. Back, you know, when we were in high school and college or whatever, there was always some lame brain liberal arts, you know, uh, professor who would say, oh, Jesus was just a myth, he never really existed. Well, that's the dumbest thing anybody could say, and nobody says that anymore, because they now know how dumb it is. So we'll talk about some of that, and also evidence for the resurrection. Um, then, responding to the arguments. We'll talk about today a little bit that uh, apologetics has several different kinds of facets. One of them is, in fact, the way it started, is a response to arguments against the faith or accusations against the faith. The first apologists in the Christian church were responding to accusations against Christianity. We'll look at that a little bit. And then um, on March 20th, applying the principles, which um, as I conceive of it right now, will be talking very practically about how you use this stuff in your own life, in your own uh, relationship with people, and in, in your witnessing, etc. So we'll get into the details. Any questions about where we're going? Okay. We start out with a biblical mandate. Why are we doing this? Why are we talking about this? There are a number of verses I can use, and I'll refer a little bit later to some of Paul's. But the primary text we would look at as the biblical mandate uh, for apologetics is from 1 Peter 3, 15 to 17. Peter writes, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this, and people often don't get this last, the next part, but do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. So Peter here says, first, be prepared to give an answer for the hope that is in you. In other words, be prepared to explain what you believe, your faith. Not, and when it says be prepared to give a reason, that's not just quoting a scripture verse, which somebody who's not already a believer, that's not going to be sufficient for them. To be able to communicate to those who are not believers, who are asking, what, what do you believe? Why do you believe that? Why do you think that makes sense? And then, the last part of this, those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ, again, the first apologetics in the Christian church were, and there was a group of early patristic fathers who were called the apologists, they began defending Christianity against accusations. Um, and so that's, that's where we're coming from. R.C. Sproul, one of the really wonderful teachers and apologists, um, head of Legionnaire Ministries, has said this, the defense of the faith is not a luxury or intellectual vanity. It is a task appointed by God that you should be able to give a reason for the hope that is in you as you bear witness before the world. We are told in Scripture to do this. It's not just an intellectual hobby or a vanity, something you know you don't have to take seriously. Um, it's it's uh, 
not a luxury. It's not something we have an option about. We are told, be prepared to explain to people why you believe what you believe. Which is exactly why I'm preaching the series of sermons I am right now. The Lord calls every Christian to be ready to give a defense, an explanation for their faith and why they believe it. Now, that doesn't mean all of you have to get PhDs. It doesn't mean you all have to go to seminary, although God may be calling some of you to that. It's never too late, okay? As long as you go. Uh, um, I love the phrase from Gene at the, the, um, the church up the street from Little Chapel, and he says, if you've got a pulse, you've got a purpose. And for some of us, our purpose still at our age is to explain the truth of the gospel to the people that God sends into our lives. Uh, in fact, you know, for those, those who don't have full-time jobs, who are retired, who... God has given you more opportunity to do that because you now have more time. So look at it that way. Um, the very simple point is you, if you believe it, you should be able to explain why you believe it. And yet I saw a recent uh, Christianity Today just did a study and they asked Christian believers, including some ministers, a number of questions about what they believed and the reason that this made the last issue of Christianity Today is because some of the answers were so contrary to Christian faith. For instance, over 50% of the people believe that Jesus was the first thing that God the Father created. This is fundamentally contrary to the creeds of the church, you know, that we believe in Jesus Christ, you know, who is co-eternal with the Father. That's what we believe. He has always existed. And yet, the more than half of the Christians surveyed by Christianity Today, just like last month or so, said that they thought Jesus was created by God the Father. That was one of the first heresies that Arianism, the thing that caused the Council of Nicaea, the first great council of the church to be called, was exactly because Arius was saying just that. One of the greatest heresies in history. And people don't get that. Well clarifying and explaining and articulating the truth of our faith is part of what apologetics does. So we need to be prepared to do that. And I think you all know as we go along, if you have any questions, feel free to stop me, yell at me, throw your shoe, whatever you have to do to get my attention. Okay, because I get rolling and you don't know when I'm going to stop. Um, introduction to apologetics, let's talk about some definitions. First, apologetics, what is it? It comes from the Greek word apologia, which means to speak or speaking in defense. It is the discipline of defending a position, often religious. Now you can have you can have an apologetic of anything, you know, an apologetic of the American legal system or whatever. But it's usually or often religious. Apologetics um, is defending a position through the systematic use of information and reason. Okay, now that's the general term apologetics, without a particular Christian uh, reference. The word apologia, which some people think it means to apologize, okay, um, it actually began, the, the Greek term came from the Greek legal system, because in a Greek legal system, the prosecutor would deliver what was called the categoria, which was the list of accusations. And then the defendant was called upon to provide the apologia, which was their defense. So apologia, apologetics, means to speak in defense of something. A um, classical example is the defense Socrates gave, you know, and, and we, we have record of that. We have the, the trial and defense of Socrates. The Apostle Paul also uses exactly this Greek word, apologia, when he is giving his speech at the trial with Festus and Agrippa. He says in Acts 26, I will make my defense, my apologia. And so it's a biblical word as well. Um, in terms of... The word apologia, when people think, oh, you're apologizing. Ironically, the English use of that word, although it does come from that same root, the English use of that word is the opposite of what it means in our sense. Because um, to apologize in English means to ask for forgiveness for a wrong that has been committed, right? Correct? Well, by the fact that you're asking forgiveness for a wrong that's been committed, Inherent in that is the sense that you really did what you did it. You're apologizing for it as a way of confessing you did it. That's the opposite of what apologetics means. Apologetics is saying, no, that's wrong. And here's why. You know, what your accusation is wrong. So it's, it's not to apologize for the Christian faith. It is the opposite of that. It's to explain why no apology is necessary because it's true against accusations, against other beliefs, etc. 
Okay. In, a, in the larger sense, uh, apologetics, religious apologetics, occurred as religions came in contact with one another. You know, when Christianity was born and it had to explain itself to Jews who didn't get it, also to the Roman pagans who didn't get it, it, is, it has to do with a, con, a conflict or confrontation between different sets of beliefs. Um, the legal nuance of the word apologetics includes the study of how to give a defense. Um, let's, the Christian apologetics, let's refine this to something more specific here. Christian apologetics combines Christian theology, natural theology, I'll, talk, I'll just find that after this, and philosophy to present a rational basis for the Christian faith to defend the faith against objections and misrepresentation, and to expose error within other religions and worldviews. There actually is, you know, much of apologetics is defensive. You know, it's to, it's to respond to something. But there is a field of apologetics called polemics, which is actually aggressive. I mean, it's, it's taking the initiative of going after other belief systems, for instance. Polemics tends to take a much more negative tone than what was originally intended by that word. But it does mean being proactive in disagreeing with what Islam or Mormonism or whatever else says. Um, whereas most of apologetics is responding to accusations. The early Christian writers from about 120 AD to about 220 AD, about that 100 years, were the first to defend the faith against critics and to recommend the faith to outsiders. And they are called in church history the apologists. I'll give you a little more detail on that a little bit later. Christian apologetics, when I say it combines Christian theology, that means biblical theology, systematic theology, all of the efforts using scripture as the basis to define what Christianity is. By the way, I don't think I even told you all. It's fine to take pictures or take notes or whatever. All of this stuff is, is going to be online. So you can access all this. That doesn't mean, I'm not telling you don't to do it, you know, don't take pictures. This is not copyrighted or anything. Uh, but it, for those of you who, you know, your hand gets tired of writing or whatever, this you can go on and print this out. All right? Um, Eventually. Eventually. <laughs> it takes a couple of days. It takes a few days, because it's not just a matter of going, going home and sticking the, you know, sticking the memory card in. And Carolyn has to convert this, uh, upload it to YouTube, and then you know, work with it from there. I'm sorry I interrupt, but, but while we're on that topic, um, if, if Ross sends me the PowerPoint early enough, I will get it up before the class. And that's it. No, seriously. That's I'm not sorry. an accusation. In the past, I have usually done that. Yeah. Okay. We've we, we we never made, gotten rolling with this. No, this, this, uh, the, first class, the first class of every course, I'm trying to do all this extra stuff, you know, outline the course and you know, decide what readings they are and everything else. And so it's harder for me to get ready for the first, first course. But usually, in most of the courses, I prepare the, uh, the PowerPoints in time to get them to her. And some people actually have them in front of them yeah, while yeah. we're doing the class. Which is and we'll try to do which that. is great and it's admirable and you really should try to do that if Ross gets his act together. I'm not in advance, all right. So that's a confession. She wasn't she wasn't being critical of me. It's just recognizing we will get. Uh, so Christian theology, but then natural theology, natural theology or general revelation, it's called in theological terms, means that God has demonstrated in the created universe. And the created universe includes logic, for instance, we believe, the things that God has given us, um, that, that seeing the created universe with our senses and uh, using the reason, the rationality, the logic that God has given us, that we are able to understand many of the things of God. That's not to the, to the denial of a special revelation like the Bible, but it's just recognizing that in addition to special or specific revelation like the revelation that comes to us from God in the Bible, we have the ability to understand many things with our brains and with our eyes. And that's natural theology. That's because, for instance, a lot of the apologetic arguments are a lot arguments of logic and reason, which is a natural theological study. It's very interesting that natural theology was considered pretty much dead and gone until the mid-20th century when a man named Alvin Plantinga, a reformed theologian, um, came along as a philosopher. He's one of the foremost philosophers in the world today, and he's an absolutely committed follower of Jesus. I had the great good, good fortune and pleasure to have a class from him called Reason and Belief in God in, the, in, the, in 1980, I guess it was. I had to do some math here. 80-81. Um, um, and Plantinga, even philosophers who would be they're the furthest away from being Christian you can imagine, read Alvin Plantinga's stuff and go, you know, there's probably not a smarter guy on the planet right now. Uh, and he uses entirely 
reason, logic, rationality to argue for the existence of God, and that is a natural theology approach. And he almost single-handedly reintroduced natural theology as a legitimate academic discipline. And if you talk about making a difference, then he did so from the perspective of being a committed Christian believer. Um, so, um, he doesn't understand why more Christians aren't smarter than they are, by the way. <laughs> he said that to our class. He said, with the exception of one or two of you, I'm astonished you've gotten this far and don't know any more than this. Um, he's Dutch, you know, I'm going to say. Uh, <laughs> um, I, he's, he, he was great. I mean, I, he and I had some great conversations. So anyway. Um, and then philosophy. Philosophy is a, can be a completely apart from any theological understanding. That's why that's listed as a separate thing from natural theology. To use philosophy um, in terms of a philosophical approach to understanding what we believe. Now, um, over the centuries, the Christian faith has gone through a number of different phases. Actually, before I do that, let me do this. Perhaps the best way to understand what apologetics is, is to understand that it answers questions for people. And so, what are some of the questions that are addressed by apologetics? Just to, and this is not exhaustive by any means. It answers questions about God. For instance, how do we know God exists? There are very valid uh, arguments for the existence of God. In fact, Peter Kreeft, who is a Catholic philosopher and theologian, on his website, uh, he, has, he lists 20 different philosophical arguments for the existence of God. The, the ontological argument, the cosmological argument, the teleological argument, the fine-tuning argument. He gets into even Pascal's, uh, Pascal's wager, which I'll probably talk about later, which is one of the sort of common sense arguments for why Christianity is your best choice. Um, so why does God, how do we know God exists? I'll get later into what apologetics can't do. It cannot prove God exists any more than um, atheists can prove God doesn't exist. But there's a difference. Let's talk about that. It asks questions about God like, aren't all religions the same, or don't all religions really believe in the same God? Which violates logic. We'll talk about how later, if you haven't heard me talk about that a lot, because I have talked about it a lot, in sermons and in classes. Uh, how can we know what God is like? You know, how do we know that what God is like as opposed to what the, you know, the Rastafarians say God is like? Who they thought he was the Emperor Haile Selassie was God. <laughs> Bless you. Um, we also have questions about Jesus that are answered by apologetics. Did Jesus really exist? Duh. Did Jesus really claim to be God? And if so, was he telling the truth? Wasn't Jesus just a great moral teacher and leader? Why do we have to say he was God? Did Jesus really perform miracles? Did Jesus really come back from the dead, which was the ultimate miracle? Those are the kind of questions that apologetics seeks to answer. Similarly, questions about the Bible, which is the source for what we believe. Is the Bible reliable? Isn't the Bible just full of contradictions and myths? Isn't, isn't the Bible interpreted in so many different ways by so many different people? Isn't the Bible basically just like every other ancient book? Those are the kind of questions people ask, and apologetics seeks to answer those. Questions about creation. What evidence is there that God created the universe? One of the most important modern trends in apologetics is scientific apologetics, which looks at the discoveries of recent science, especially in the last 50 years, as evidence for the fact that this did not happen by accident. The fine-tuning argument, which again I've preached on recently. Um, see what you're missing if you don't come to our church? Uh, how can science and Christianity both be true? Well, the assumption in that is that they're inherently contradictory, which may be the wrong assumption. Why does God allow suffering and evil in the world? The existence of evil is the biggest sort of philosophical and moral challenge to the existence of God, and yet there are some very clear explanations for that. In fact, this is, this is probably the biggest argument that people use against God, just from their gut. And yet, uh, and, and it's so important, in fact, that there's a special name for it. The effort to try to explain how there can be evil and suffering in the world, if the world, uh, if God is an all-loving and all-powerful God, then how can there be evil and suffering in the world? That effort to explain that is called a theodicy, special name for it. We, we're going to get into that, all right? One of my, my last sermon in this series, I think, will be why we believe that evil does not disprove God. So we'll, we'll talk about that. So these are the kinds of things that Christianity seeks to, or that apologetics seeks to, to address for us. There are a lot of others. 
virtually any accusation that's made against Christianity, there's some aspect of apologetics that try to respond to that. Virtually any doubt or question, serious doubt or question that is offered up against Christianity, you know, to Christianity, apologetics tries to address it. This is just a sampling um, of those kinds of things. Yes, Pam. These are so important that I'm just wondering if you would ever consider just doing a whole seminar on just individual groups of questions like this. Um, well, we're going to get into a lot of these in this class. Um, a lot of them are answered in those books you just bought, okay, and other books as well. For instance, any of the factual kinds of stuff, like the Bi about the Bible or um, about the nature of Jesus or the existence of God. The reason I I selected that Josh McDowell book is he has whole chapters on that stuff, and it's, it's very concise. You know, it's names and dates and quotes as to why we believe this is true. Okay, what we believe about it. So, but yeah, we are going to get into that stuff. We'll, we'll talk about it. And, and any time, any as we go along, if there's any things I'm not touching on that you feel there's a question you need to ask. Uh, now, the purpose of this class is almost more um, an introduction to the field of apologetics than it is an actual doing of apologetics. You understand what I mean? Yes. That doesn't mean we're not going to do that. We're going to get into some of this stuff so that you understand how this gets answered. But this, as a, this whole course is an introduction to the field of apologetics. And hopefully to get you interested that you're going to want to buy more of Josh McDowell's stuff, or William Lane Craig's stuff, or R.C. Sproul's stuff, or, you know, go for it, Alvin Plantinga's stuff, um, so that you'll take this very seriously. Yes, Rod? <coughs> Isn't apologetics like a subset of, of, of evangelism? The um, question is, is apologetics a subset of evangelism? Um, yes, but it's bigger than that, because there's different ways. Some apologetics is intended for the purpose of convincing non-believers of the truth of faith, some apologetics is intended to straighten out Christians who have gone astray within the faith. So it really does both. It is a discipleship and an evangelistic kind of strategy. Um, and in some cases, it's, it's apologetics is kind of the fire department of the Christian faith in some ways. And that is when a, when a problem arises, you know, there are accusations being made. It's the job of apologetics to put out that fire. And it may not necessarily convert anybody, and it may not necessarily... Um, straighten somebody out in the mistakes they're making within the Christian it's, faith. It's a responder. Exactly. Whereas evangelism is more, there's, no, there's nothing to respond to. You're, you're initiating. Yeah. Yeah. Apologetics. Polemics is the, is the branch of, apo of uh, apologetics that initiates sort of uh, arguments against things. Most of apologetics, as we're going to look at it, I'm not really going to get into polemics, is a response mechanism. But again, it may be a response to try to convince people to become Christians. It may be a response to try to get Christians who have been led astray to be corrected in their faith. Or it may simply be put, trying to put out a fire before it causes more damage without necessarily converting anybody or, or straightening anybody out. <coughs> That's what the Council of Nicaea was. I mean, it was putting out the fire of Arius' heresy. Um, so, any, question, any more questions about that? I want to give you... Um, First, and then we'll take a break, sort of a brief history of Christian apologetics, some of the key points, um, because I think that'll help you get a kind of a grasp on it. The first period of apologetics were the apostles themselves, especially the Apostle Paul. Paul wrote and spoke against a number of opponents to Christianity or problems within Christianity. For instance, he spoke against the Judaizers. Ebionites is the technical historical word for them. These were Jews that had converted to Christianity, but still thought you were, that people were required to be Jews. They had to be circumcised. Um, Acts 15, the whole chapter, is about the J Jerusalem Council, where they address the issue of, does somebody who's a Gentile who becomes a Christian have to become a Jew? Do they have to be circumcised, etc.? Well, that whole school of Judaizers who were creating problems for Paul, and it didn't all get resolved at the Jerusalem Council, that was one of the groups that he argued against and presented reasons why they were wrong. That was apologetics. The proto-Gnostics, the early Gnostics, who um, the early heresy, and they tried to sort of latch themselves onto Christianity. I say proto-Gnostic because uh, technically people say that Gnosticism didn't come along until the second century. But we see evidence in Paul's letters that he was responding to some of the doctrines that were Gnostic. It was a heresy that had to do with you know, only so many people get in, and there's a secret knowledge, and if you're not one of the ones elected to get this secret knowledge, then you can't be saved, and Jesus wasn't really God, 
He was just a great teacher, and he showed us the way of knowledge. Not, uh, Gnostic, the word gnosis in, in Greek means uh, knowledge, and so that's what that was. Um, the Greco-Roman cults, some of the religious cults of that day, the pagan worship, the Roman authorities um, that demanded, for instance, emperor worship. And I'm going to get into, um, I'll talk about the apologists in a minute. Paul began to get into this, uh, but the, the details of this came a little bit later. And then false Christians, people who were creating problems, making claims that were not consistent with Scripture, were not consistent with what God had taught. And so he argued against them. And in all of those ways, Paul, and somewhat John, and some, in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and somewhat Peter, are addressing problems in the way that would be considered apologetics. Then the second um, period, the one that really focused apologetics, are the early apologists. There were a group of people that included um, Irenaeus and Justin Martyr and Origen and others who became known as the apologists. They were responding to accusations, especially from the Roman authorities and religious um, leaders, that Christians were all kinds of awful things. Christians were accused of being cannibals because they get together and eat the body of their founder. The body, they eat his body and drink his blood. They're cannibals. Um, they said that Christians were immoral because they have love feasts. Who knows what goes on there? Um, sounds like some old bitty that I've known in the past. I'm always making up stories about this stuff. Um, they said that the Christians were incestuous because they referred to each other as brother and sister, even their husbands and wives. They called brothers and sisters. They were marrying, having incestuous relationships with their brothers and sisters. That it was breaking the laws of Rome, um, even so far as after Nero's little thing and you know fiddling and Rome burning, the accusation that Nero made to get the burden off of him that Christians were responsible for burning the city of Rome. They were convenient scapegoat. Now. All of these accusations were being made against Christians. The apologists, starting in early in the second century, around 120, they come along and they start writing very thoughtful, very eloquent arguments and explanations for why these things weren't true. In fact, not, that's not true, but instead, here's what real Christianity is like. And so they really kind of laid the foundations for a reasoned, impassioned, but still reasoned argument for what Christianity is and what it isn't. That's the putting out the fire thing. Because the Roman authorities, every time some, some rumor started in a Roman city where there were Christians, these people are cannibals and they're you know, having these big orgies, um, then there would be a, a, not only a, a lack of people willing to listen to the Christian faith, but there would be an uprising often against the Christians. A lot of them were being killed. And so there was a real reason why they needed to argue about it. Okay? Bless you. Then... Um, Next, we get into the later apologists. Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, sort of bridge there. Athanasius, Augustine in the 400s. Um, they come along, and instead of, of speaking against the Roman authorities, what the Roman authorities were accusing them of, they begin to uh, address the predominant heresies of their day, like full-blown Gnosticism, which had come along in that time. Arianism. I mentioned that Arius um, was the first great heretic, or, you know, the cause of the first... Council of the Church in Nicaea, claiming Jesus was not eternal. Um, so that sort of focused on identifying what is the nature of Jesus. That's those questions about who was Jesus, did he really claim to be God, etc. Um, Manichaeism. Augustine had went, spent a period of time as a uh, Manichaeist, which is sort of a... Uh, uh, very difficult to explain in two, a few words. Uh, it's... Um, Well, I, I, I'm, I'm hesitating because I'm trying to figure out how to explain it without getting into a lot of details. Anyway, it was a heresy. <laughs> and, and Augustine had been involved in it, he got out of it, and then he spent a lot of energy arguing against it. In fact, one of his great treatises was called Against the Manichaeans. Um, they gave reasons why those, those heresies or those, those religions were wrong, because most of them claimed to be pseudo-Christian. That has always been the case. Since the start of Christianity, so many of these... Arian claimed to be a Christian, you know, he was a Christian, he was an uh, officer in the church, a bishop. Um, he claimed that he had the right idea about Jesus and others didn't. The Gnosticism was a, a heresy of Christianity. Manichaeism claimed something, some Christian aspects. The same thing is true today. The same thing has always been true. There are always pseudo-Christian 
Organizations that want to claim the name Christian, and yet they have fundamental disagreements with the basic principles of what Christianity is. And uh, not, not to pick on people, but still we have to be honest about this. Today that would include Mormonism, which is not a Christian belief. Um, Christian science, Jehovah's Witnesses, Scientology, and on and on. All of them, Scientology not as much, but all of those others claim to be Christian in their orientation. And yet they are, their basic beliefs are not consistent with the Christian faith. Um, Mormonism, for example, if you ask more, uh, a Mormon, do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? And, and what they say about Jesus is always the ultimate test. Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? They would say yes. But if you dig deeper, Mormonism professes that God himself was once a human who lived on another planet and became divine, that Jesus was just a man who became the perfect example and that way became God, and any other person can achieve enlightenment and become a God, and in fact will be a God over your own territory in, in the celestial realms at some point. Um, those are doctrines of the Mormon belief, and that's not Christianity, okay? And we need to understand that. And so from ancient times to modern times, there have always been pseudo-Christian religions. And we need to understand how are they different than us, and why do we believe what we believe and not that? That's apologetics. We have then, we get into the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages saw the growth of scholasticism, which was kind of an intellectual Christian movement, the ultimate, and, and they sort of reclaimed philosophy at that time. Uh, scholasticism um, was the Middle Ages, the medieval period. Uh, the ultimate scholastic scholar and philosopher, although he did not like being called a philosopher, was Thomas Aquinas, the Catholic philosopher. Thomas Aquinas, for instance, developed five, the five arguments for the existence of God which you know, are versions of the ontological, cosmological, teleological, etc. He presented them in such a way, very philosophically, uh, using very fancy language, but he said that all, all five of them had to be taken together, and together they were an equivalent evident proof of the existence of God, but you couldn't sort of pick and choose, which is what we do. Um, then you get into the Reformation. The Reformation scholars focused on a return to the original Bible texts, in that way, they would have been, been considered uh, biblical apologists, because I'm going to give you some different kinds of apologetics here in a minute. Biblical apologists deal with the reliability of Scripture, the accuracy of Scripture, the inerrancy of Scripture, why it can be trusted, what it tells us, etc. And because in the, the uh, Reformation period, one of the great cries of the Reformation period was sola scriptura, which means Scripture alone as the authority for the faith. They also had a cry, we talked about this in biblical interpretation, um, one of the things they said was ad fontes, which means back to the source, back to the source documents. Not what somebody has interpreted for us, but what did the original documents say, which is why Martin Luther, in a, a one-year period when he was hiding from the Roman, Holy Roman Emperor and the Pope, he translated the original Greek and Hebrew from the Old and New Testament into a German Bible, the German Bible. And in doing so, he also invented modern German. We talked about that history. So, they reclaimed the original Bible text, the focus on the text, and they also began to develop a philosophy and, and philosophical arguments in light of those texts. And then modern apologists, some of my very favorites, <laughs> G.K. Chesterton, C.S. Lewis, Francis Schaeffer, all three of those men were very influential in my life. I used to be on the board of the American Chesterton Society. The only thing, well, Al Plantinga, uh, mentioned already, and there are others that you know, R.C. Sproul and on and on and on. I mean, that carries right up today. William, uh, William Lane Craig and others. They use a whole variety of apologetics. It's almost as though most of the prior periods, there was an area in which the Christian scholars focused, whether it be philosophical apologetics, whether it be biblical apologetics, whether it be miracle apologetics, um, or the responsive apologetics, whatever it was. In modern times, there has been a huge diversity of all kinds of different apologetic approaches going on simultaneously. Whether, and we'll talk about some of the different people who do different kinds of these in a bit. Um, and, and there's an enormous variety of things out there. It's especially true in the last 30, 20 to 30 years, there has been the growth of the new atheist movement. The Richard Dawkinses and the Sam Harrises and the, you know, the Christopher Hitchenses who are out there, who are, who are academics, mostly academics, who are proclaiming that Christianity doesn't make sense, or that it's even evil, 
the book God is Not Good, is one of the New Atheist publications. Um, the, the, the various societies, you know, the, the skeptical society, the free thinker societies, etc., all of them are very aggressive in attacking the Christian faith. Um, well, there is a, you know, there's a whole school of people now who are responding to those new atheists. And the typical response is, you guys don't think very good, do, do, do you? Because they don't. Most of the new atheists, when, when some of the brilliant scholars that are working today, there's a guy named Daniel uh, Bent Hart who wrote a book called The Atheist Delusion. And oh man, I almost feel bad for the atheist the way this guy talks about, he right? Was mean. He's really mean. <laughs> but he says, you read this and it's like a primary school book. Can they not think clearer and write more clearly than that? You know, um, there's a whole school of Christian apologetics now that is specifically targeted at that because these people have an inordinate influence in our culture, in academia, in popular culture, in what's considered intelligent nowadays. And so that's one of the most modern things is the, the response, the apologetic, Christian apologetic response to the New Atheists. And if you, re if you really read the New Atheist stuff, they really aren't very good. But everybody's convinced that they're the smart ones, mostly because they don't read them. They just hear somebody telling us that they're the smart ones. All right? So that gives you kind of a history and overview of apologetics. Um, we're going to take a break. Okay, um, there is, I mentioned the um, Peter, the verse from Peter that talks about the fact that you prepare to give an uh, explanation for the hope or a reason for the hope that is in you. Well, we also need to recognize that there are a number of places where Paul does talk about the task of apologetics. Philippians, especially, <coughs> Philippians 1 7, he talks about that he is presenting a defense and confirmation of the gospel. In Philippians 1.16, uh, Paul describes himself as being appointed for the defense of the gospel. The word he uses there is apologia in Greek. And then in Titus 1.9, and this should be an inspiration for all Christians um, and leaders, he's talking about the ordination of elders in the church. And he says to Titus, um, holding, fast, holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he, the appointed elder, will be able to both exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict it. So, <clears throat> Paul as well as Peter. In fact, the book of Galatians, the book of 1 Corinthians in Paul are very specifically books of apologetics. In, for the Apostle John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John are very much apologetic books. He's dealing with problems in the church or people who are wrong in the church and in that way are corrected in apologetics. Okay? So let's talk about types of Christian apologetics. Um, I thought I had set this up so I get one at a time. So don't read any further than I'm telling you. <laughs> um, there are a number of different kinds of apologetics. Generally speaking, they, we have what's called classical apologetics, which is not up there. So classical apologetics stresses the rational arguments for the existence of God, the historicity of Jesus, the reliability of the Bible, etc. So they are, classical apologetics deals with rationality. But there's also a kind of apologetics called presuppositional apologetics, which deals with the, with the challenging of people's presuppositions. The, the idea behind that is, whatever someone's presuppositions are, will dictate what they believe and what they're willing to listen to. If, for instance, somebody has a presupposition against anything supernatural existing, then you obviously are going to have a hard time explaining to them that Jesus was born of a virgin or or walked on water, or turned water into wine, or rose from the dead. And so, prepositional, um, uh, presuppositional rather, apologetics addresses those presuppositions and challenges those before it gets into the facts of the matter. Okay, well, let's talk about a couple of these different kinds of apologetics. Um, uh, first, I guess I should say that there are some Christians who have a problem with the very idea of apologetics. They say, they say that um, should the apologist use only the criteria that are acceptable to unbelievers? In other words, sort of the, much of the principle, not all the principle is, when, when Peter says, be always prepared to give a, a reason for the faith that is in you, well, quoting a Bible verse to somebody who is not a Christian and doesn't believe in the Bible and doesn't know it, it's not going to get you very far, you would think. So many apologists would say, we only, apologetics really only is viable in terms of any kind of evangelistic apologetics if we use arguments and reasons that are um, free from the Christianese. 
Something, in other words, that an unbeliever would be willing to listen to. A logical argument, a historic argument, an argument from archaeology or from science. Some people disagree with that, and they say that since the Bible says that um, reason is not sufficient, but that rather people only come to faith in light of God's Holy Spirit opening their minds and hearts, then what's with all, you know, what's with all the rationality kind of stuff? Um, some would say that using, the prayer, using prayer and the Bible and talking about the sinful nature of unbelievers is necessary. Some would say they're not going to listen to that. They don't pay attention to that stuff if they're not already in the faith. So there's always a challenge as to how you interact given sort of the principles on which our faith is built versus what people are prepared to listen to if you're trying to break through to them with sort of evangelistic apologetics. Um, one quote that, is, that, that I'm looking for here is someone has said, the gospel is the best defense and living according to Jesus' Jesus' teaching is the best argument. Well, there's an extent to which that's partly true. But my, you know, part of what I believe, because I'm a supporter of apologetics and reasonable arguments with faith, if we believe that it's valid to preach to the unsaved, that we do evangelism by preaching the word to the unsaved, how it, and yet we know and believe that it is only as the Holy Spirit touches hearts that they're prepared to receive it, how is it any, any different if we use a message that will relate to things that an unbeliever can understand, and the Holy Spirit then touches their heart to accept that that is evidence for the faith. To me, there, does, there is no difference in those two. So I don't accept the fact that using reasonable, rational arguments or, you know, uh, arguments from history, philosophy, whatever, that that's not valid because it doesn't use the Bible and it doesn't, you know, uh, any more than preaching an evangelistic message and counting on the Holy Spirit to touch a non-believer's heart um, anyway. The Holy Spirit will do what He will, and I'm going to talk about what apologetics won't do later, and one of them is it will not argue people into the kingdom of God. But it may help re re lower the barriers some, so that they better hear what the Holy Spirit tells them, okay? So let's talk about some of the kinds of um, apologetics. First, biblical apologetics, um, and these aren't in any particular order. The biblical apologetics is one of the older ones, but... Um, this, some, some representatives of this, and this could be a much longer list. In every case, this could be a much longer list, because there are a lot of people who've been doing this and are doing this. People like Robert Dick Wilson, Gleason Archer, Norman Geisler, R.C. Sproul, some of these names you may have heard. They are popular writers. Um, Robert Dick Wilson, probably not as much uh, longer ago. But biblical apologetics is concerned with the authorship and date of the biblical books, the biblical canon, biblical inerrancy, those kinds of things. How does archaeology support the truth of Scripture? Why and how can we rely on the Bible? How are we supposed to read it and understand it, like biblical inerrancy or biblical infallibility? The idea being that if, we if, it is, if we're effective in convincing people the Bible is a viable source of truth, then that opens the opportunity for a lot more things. That one of the first arguments is, what do we think about the Bible? Is it accurate? Is it reliable? Is it true? Um, if we can do that, then they perhaps will be more open to other kinds of understanding of what the faith is. This is the same basic reason, the reason why that's often the first thing, is um, the reason why when you study systematic apologetics, how many of you all remember, what's the first area of systematic apologetics we study in our class? Systematic theology? What's that? Are you saying systematic theology? Oh, what did I say? Theology. Well, systematic, systematic theology. In our system, systematics is a shorthand for systematic theology. In, our, in systematic theology class, what's the first big uh, doctrine we study? No. Well, no, the word. Doctrine of the word. You, you start with the Bible in systematic theology before you start with God because the Bible is the source of everything we know about. That and the Holy Spirit who affirms and teaches us from the Bible. So in the same way, if you can convince, if, if, if the veracity of the Bible is the first theological topic you study in systematic theology, likewise, there is some validity to the argument that if you can convince people the Bible in apologetics is a source of truth, then they're open to other things. All right. Second kind of apologetics is moral apologetics. Jonathan Edwards, the great Puritan preacher in, in America, the uh, first and greatest American theologian, Jonathan Edwards. So many people have only read Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God and they think that he's a hellfire and damnation, you know, throw them out if they don't agree kind of person. He is the most thoughtful theologian America has ever produced. 
So Jonathan Edwards, C.S. Lewis, Peter Kreeft, the, I mentioned him earlier, the Catholic, uh, evangelical Catholic theologian. Such a thing is possible. Um, moral apologetics states that there is real moral apologetic, um, moral obligation, that morality is a real and objective fact, and that we have an obligation to be morally responsible, and that the existence of an objective moral law is in itself evidence for God. When someone says that line isn't straight, you could legitimately say, based on what? And they would say, well, based upon a straight line. Well, how do you know there's such a thing as a straight line? When somebody says, well, that's not good, that's not right, well, based on what? Well, based on what is good and right. Well, where do you get the idea of what is good and right? The very fact that all human beings at all times and all places have had a sense that there is such a thing as a moral good and a moral evil, where do we get that unless there really is something that is the absolute moral good, which is God? Now, I'm not doing this justice in 30 seconds of describing it, but you're going to read a lot about it in your Christianity. That's one of the first major arguments that C.S. Lewis makes, is the presence of the moral law, the sense that there is good, no matter what your religious belief is, there is real good and things that, that, that don't, don't match up to that, is evidence that there is an ultimate good which is, by definition, God. Okay? So, moral apologetics. There is then scientific apologetics. This is, as I said before, kind of the, the current way that, that most of the apologists are surfing. This is the, the point that a lot of people, given the discoveries of modern science in the last 50 years, the fine-tuning argument, the anthropic principle, the anthropic principle basically says the only way human life exists here, with all the... the unbelievable improbability of all these factors, over 200 different factors they've identified that are necessary to be exactly as they are for human life to exist, the likelihood that that could be accidentally. Uh, Fred Hoyle, the astronomer, the person who first quoted, uh, first coined the phrase Big Bang, Fred Hoyle said the likelihood of all those things happening at once is the same likelihood of having a tornado blow through a junkyard and leaving in its wake a fully formed and functional 747 jet. <laughs> That's the odds of it. Someone else has calculated that for all of these defined principles in science within the fine tuning, for all of them to be exactly as they are as necessary for human life, it would be the equivalent of flipping a coin and getting heads 10 quintillion times in a row. Those are examples of the scientific apologetics, and they quote specific science to defend that. Things like the fact that if the force of gravity were different, either stronger or weaker by 10 to the 40th power, then the Great Bang would have either caused the universe to expand too quickly for planets and stars to exist, or it caved in on itself before it started. So that's scientific apologetics. Stop me if you have any questions along the way. Um, Michael Behe, by the way, has written um, several books. Darwin's Black Box is one of them. Behe is a, um, a biologist and especially deals with microbiology, and he's identified, uh, what well, he really is a hero of the principle of um, uh, irreducible complexity. What that means is evolution says everything that exists evolved from a previous state based upon a, an advantage that was gained. Okay, if if black moths on dark-skinned trees were not be, could not be seen by birds, and so they all lived, and the white moths got eaten, then black moths reproduce, and they produce more black moths, and that's how evolution. You have, there has to be an advantage involved. Well, Behe identifies the fact that there are so many cases where there is no intermediate state between a one-celled animal and where we are that could be seen as being developed according to advantages. For instance, the human eye. The human eye, um, in all of its complexity, what is the intermediate state? Now, the uh, evolutionists say that the human eye started as a light-sensitive freckle. <laughs> How do you get from a light-sensitive freckle to the rods and cones and the, you know, the optic nerve and the, the, the ability of the iris to open and close based upon sensitivity of light, the fact that two eyes give you three-dimensional perception, and on and on and on and on and on, the complexity beyond anything imaginable. How do you get there from a light-sensitive freckle 
Understanding that each stage of evolutionary development has to be advantageous over the previous one. The irreducible complexity is saying the complexity of the human eye can't be backwardly engineered to anything else. It had to emerge fully blown or you can't explain it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Behe has also done a lot of things with micro, uh, microorganisms like the flagellum. You know what the flagellum is? It's a little one-celled animal and it has a tail that it uses to propel itself through liquids, okay, and it whips this tail back and forth. Well, by taking it apart, Behe identified the fact that the mechanism that allows that tail to revolve and to move it forward has every component of a motor, the kind of motor that we use to power things now. It has, you know, and how did that all happen? All those pieces to just happen to create the ability of that one-celled animal to motivate itself through liquid. He argues there's no previous state. There's no you can't reduce that complexity to anything prior to that that makes you know that would be an advantage that would make evolution happen. There is an irreducible complexity to much of what we see in the world. Got that? Have I lost you? You're good with it. Okay. So that's a lot of what the scientific apologetics. Either dealing with cosmology, how the world came to be. Um, how the universe came to be, or biology, some deal with, with physics. Uh, things like the fact that, you know, when, when water freezes, does it freeze from the top down or the bottom up? That's top down. Water is the only liquid that freezes on top. If it froze like every other liquid from the bottom up, no animal life or plant life could exist in water. What would happen to our planet if everything in the ocean died? Okay? How, how is it? How is it that water, the one thing that's necessary for all life, has characteristics that are inconsistent with any other liquid? You know, you add all that kind of stuff up, and you get the scientific apologetic. That science, for those who are open and objective and willing to really pay attention to what it's saying, and we're going to talk about this later. I'm actually, you know, you get me going, and I start preaching, and, you know, um, that all of these things together argue for the existence of an intentional creation by personal God. Uh, experiential apologetics. Experiential apologetics argues that experience itself is a self-verifying evidence for the Christian faith. And in that you get not only the personal testimony of people whose lives have been changed. Hundreds of millions of people over the last 2,000 years who say, I know this is true because God touched me and changed me. There's some weight to that. You also have the existence of the church. The very fact that believers from the very earliest days were prepared to die for this belief. Not many people are willing to die for something they know is not true. The early apostles and followers of them who were willing to give their lives for this belief did so because they absolutely believed it was true. This was not some politically convenient thing that they were doing. So the very existence of the church as an experiential presence argues for the faith. Um, Alvin Plantinga, one of his, he's got a lot of stuff, but one of his things is he talks about what's now become known as the, uh, the evangelical epistemology, evangelical epistemology, I think the words, um, in which he says that in the same way that human beings have senses that we, assume, we take for granted that they are uh, inherent rightful senses to have, the sense of sight, the sense of smell, the sense of taste, a touch, etc. And that if somebody lacks one of those, we see that as an absence of something that is inherent and appropriate to us. If someone is blind, they're missing something that we believe is supposed to be a rightful characteristic. Well, very convincingly, Alvin Plantinga argues that given the predominance, every human culture we've ever known has believed in the divine or the supernatural or God in some sense. We have never found a culture in history any time that did not believe in some form of God or the divine. So Plantinga argues, less from a historical than a philosophical point of view, is it appears that we have an inherent sense, just like we have the five physical senses, we have an inherent sense of the divine. And that we don't have to justify it, we don't have to argue for it, we don't have to argue for, for the existence and reality of God any more than I have to try to prove to somebody that I'm looking at, at um, Mike and he's wearing a blue shirt. 
I can, I can say that's true because I have eyes, and they, they tell me that. Flanagan argues that, that the experience of God, which is universal in the human culture, appears to be so inherent that we should accept it as being basic to what it means to be human and not feel we have to prove it. Every time I tell somebody what I see, I don't have to prove to them that I really do have sight and, you know, that, et cetera, et cetera. Make sense? Yeah. That's a very superficial argument from his, from his yeah. doctrine of Christian, uh, many God. Christian war. What's that? If they, then you got to talk about the God. Well, and, but, and, and that's true. But in, in apologetics, for instance, whenever we talk about the existence of God, we are arguing in a more generic sense. Once you, you know, if, if you can't get past the point of does God exist, you're not going to get to the point of Jesus. And so the first arguments are for the mo more basic of the kind of uh, doctrines. And the same thing is true with Platinum, although he is a Christian. Ross. Yes. Just, uh, if you go back to the previous slide. Oh, the, the, okay. And just, you had uh, William Demensky. Do you mean? Demensky. Yeah, uh, Dems Demsky. Yeah. It's Demensky. Yeah, William Dems. Uh, it should be Dembinsky, not Deminsky. Yeah. Sorry, I misspelled that. There's a B in there. You're right. Good catch, Dan. Um, Dembinsky. He and B he are two of the more more recent uh, writers in scientific apologetics. Um, we then have philosophical apologetics, which is sort of you know my, where I see my wheelhouse. Um, philosophical apologetics deals with primarily with the arguments for the existence of God, but they go further than that as well. Um, but when you you see here Norman Geisler, William Lane Craig, who you've got a book of now, um, R.C. Sproul, and many others, concerning themselves with the arguments, this goes back to some of the ancient, most ancient of the Christian writers, Origen and his development of the ontological argument for, for God. I'm sorry, not Origen, Ansel. Uh, Anselm uh, Canterbury, who wrote the ontological argument, which is an argument from the, the that the existence of God is required by the very concept of God. Um, the cosmological argument, that the existence of the world itself is an argument for the existence of God. We'll get into some of this stuff later on if you haven't heard these before. The teleological argument, which is the watchmaker analogy, that the very fact that the design of the world is so complex in the same way that a watch demands a watchmaker, a complex created world, or world requires a creator. The fine-tuning argument is a development, it's a, it's a modern scientific advancement on the teleological or watchmaker argument. Um, you get into um, various other kinds of philosophical arguments. When you talk about issues like, um, are all religions not equally the same? Then you get into the basic philosophical rules of logic. The law of non-contradiction. Some of you have heard me say this a thousand times now, but um, it, you need to know it. The law of non-contradiction, the second of the law, three laws of thought, says something cannot both be true and not true at the same time. If I say Jesus is the Son of God and somebody else says he's not, we both can't be right. That's irrational. It makes no sense. Well, that's another example that philosophical apologetics will apply logic, which is a field of philosophy rationality to the arguments, not only for the existence of God, but for a number of other things as well. Um, the arguments of prophetic uh, fulfillment in apologetics. A number of different writers, um, let me find my notes so I don't keep that a little bit on my shoulder here. Particularly Blaise Pascal was, in, was involved in that. Do you know Blaise Pascal? Shame on you if you don't. Uh, Blaise Pascal is one you ought to know about. Blaise Pascal was one of the greatest physicists scientists and philosophers ever, there are at least three or four major principles or theorems named after Blaise Pascal, and he died in his 30s. He was an absolutely committed Christian. Um, his book, The Pensées, he was French, uh, The Pensées, which means thoughts, um, that's where we get the word pensive. The Pensées are a series of just thoughts about God and about the truth of the faith, and very, very powerful. I mean, really good stuff. And he, as a philosopher and scientist, he created the laws of probability. Because he had a friend who was a card player, and his card player says, is there anything you can do, Blaze, to help me win? And so Pascal sits down and comes up with, mathematically, the laws of probability. So he can tell his friend, you know, if, well, if you've already seen, you know, if, if, you, if you're drawn to an inside straight, here are the odds of you getting it, etc. 
brilliant mathematician, brilliant philosopher, brilliant physicist. When did um, he live? Um, 15, 1600s? Oh, why can't I think of that? Let me think of it. I'll give you a minute. I can look it up. Yeah, look it up. I think it was earlier. Maybe, maybe 15th, 15th century, I think 15th century. Um, we have a friend who wrote a, a book uh, of Pascal, about Pascal. Um, so, Pascal, Peter Stoner, Josh McDowell, again, McDowell, uh, Josh McDowell in his books talks about prophetic fulfillment as one of the signs of uh, the, that Christianity alone, Judaism, the Judeo-Christian faith, professes to have made prophetic statements about what is to be, and then we have evidence that they really came to be. Um, we have all the statements of Isaiah, for instance, were made 700 years before the time of Jesus. Yes? 1623 to 1662. Oh, okay, so the, the 17th century. Okay. Um, 1600, 17th century. Pascal. Um, didn't Josh try to disprove? I mean, didn't go in as a non believer and going through that evidence that demands a very good man conversion? Well, there are a lot of people like that. Lee Strobel, uh, that's true. He did. Josh McDowell uh, first tried to disprove the faith. Um, C.S. Lewis was an atheist, but he wasn't out to disprove the faith when he became Christian. Um, Lee Strobel is a very popular writer today. He was a journalist who set out to disprove the faith and ended up becoming a Christian. He written a whole series of books called The Case for Christ, The Case for the Faith, you know, etc. The Case for the Resurrection, The Case for Easter. Um, Strobel is quite good, too. Um, so, prophetic fulfillment argues that the biblical prophecies and the fulfillment of those prophecies provide strong evidence. We then have historical and legal evidentialism. For those lawyers in the group, <coughs> You would appreciate this. A number of legal minds, Simon Greenleaf was one, uh, John Warwick Montgomery's a theologian but with a legal kind of orientation. These are people who, um, legal scholars, who claim that if you apply Western legal standards to the argument for and against the Christian faith, especially they started with Christ's resurrection, that the evidence is compelling, that there is evidence beyond any reasonable doubt that these things are true. And that's a whole branch of apologetics, is using a very legal, formal kind of evidential argument in support of the beliefs of the Christian faith. We then have pre presuppositional apologetics, which I suggested or mentioned to you earlier. Uh, John Frame, Greg Vanson, Cornelius Van Til, quite a few of the Dutch theologians have gotten into this, Abraham Kuyper some, claiming that the presuppositions that we have are essential to any philosophical position. And then arguing that logically the non-Christian presuppositions on which they base their, uh, their, their insistence, the non-supernatural uh, events, etc., that those things can be reduced to absurdity. If you argue at them long enough, they fritter themselves away. That there is no legitimate presuppositional standard that will lead you to a non-Christian belief. Okay? And I know that sounds very complicated. It's a lot more complicated than what I can tell you in 30 seconds on each one of these. Um, any questions about any of those? <coughs> in terms of just types of apologetics. We'll get into a little of all of that kind of stuff as we go along. Um, and it'll be fun. <laughs> so why are we doing this? Why do we need to do this? That's a good question. <laughs> I heard that. Um, <laughs> First, we're doing this, Christians, because we're told to do it. We are commanded to defend the faith. So we need to do it for that reason. Second, we knew it, we need it, so that Christians know their own faith. Remember what I said earlier, that more than half of the, of the people surveyed, Christians, did not know that Jesus is co-eternal with the Father. Um, there is an extraordinary inability amongst Christians to, to explain what they believe. Um, how many of you, if I ask you to in 30 seconds, could you explain to me the doctrine of the Trinity? Could you? Carol, good, because she's heard me do it a hundred times. Use the example of the egg. The egg, okay. Um, or water. Water doesn't work. Water's a terrible one. Because, yeah, people use that. They say that water is an example of the Trinity because it exists in three forms. It can be ice, it can be steam, it can be liquid. It can't be all three at once. And God exists in all three forms at one time. And so for that reason, that analogy, all analogies break down at some point. Um, uh, but that's one that... Uh, that was one I wasn't going to use. Okay. <laughs> and, and for me, after years of trying, you know, of using the, the egg is one of the better analogies, because one egg, one thing, has three distinct parts. It has a shell, a yolk, a white. 
All three have their particular purposes in the egg, but it makes up one egg in the same way that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three persons in one God, one Trinity, one, one divine being. Uh, the thing that I use, most of you have heard, is we're made in the image of God. And it occurred to me one day, we're made in the image of God, the Trinity, because every human being has three distinct parts. We have the controlling mind, the cognitive part that makes the decisions for us, which is like God the Father. We have the part of us that responds to the non-cognitive, you know, my spirit, my soul, my heart, whatever you want to call it, that, that responds to love and honor and trust and loyalty and those things that are not cognitive but still are very real and in many ways some of the most valuable parts of me. This is the Holy Spirit who deals with encouragement and you know, conviction and all of those non-cognitive things. And then there is the physical body in the same way that Jesus the Son was incarnate in a physical body. There, I have three distinct parts. And, and Within, within boundaries, one or, one or more of those parts can die or stop functioning completely and the rest of it stay alive. My body can completely stop functioning apart from mechanical maintenance, you know, iron lung or whatever, and yet my mind, my spirit could still be functioning. There is a distinction between those pieces and to me that's one of the ways that we understand that. But again, there's any number of topics that Christians simply today have not thought about, are not prepared to explain if somebody asks you. If somebody said to you, why do you believe the Bible is true? What would you say? This is why we have apologetics. Third, apologetics can help lead non-Christians to belief and so to eternal salvation. The fact is that accepting Jesus Christ is the route to eternal salvation, rejecting Jesus Christ, even if it's because nobody bothered to explain it to you very well, are grounds for people being condemned to hell forever. I don't like to say that. I don't like to feel that. But that is the Christian faith. And so we're given the task of helping to share the good news so that more people will come to believe the truth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died to, to allow us to be forgiven of our sins. Right? So we do this for the eternal blessing of the people in the world. Apologetics can help counter the bad image Christianity has in the media and in the culture. Christians have a, you know, have a terrible reputation, and a lot of it, unfortunately, is deserved. People who say really stupid things so that... And, and Augustine, in the 400s, said, don't say things that are ignorant because people will think badly of the Christian faith if you do. He said that 1,600 years ago, and we're still doing it. So we need, and, and it's more than just intellectual, we also need to show a moral, you know, we need to show a compassionate um, side of the Christian faith so that people will, will feel differently about Christians. I can't tell you the number of times that I've had somebody say to me, I, well, example, um, Carolyn's old boss had a, had a nephew, grandson, Alex. Nephew. Nephew, I thought it was nephew. Um, a nephew who was doing a paper for a class in high school. And he was looking at why people believe the things they do. And he, uh, Joanne said, well, Ross is a theologian, why don't you talk to him? Uh, Joanne was one of Carolyn's bosses. Well, Alex called me and we spent a couple hours on the phone. And Joanne later reported to me that Alex came back and said, you know, I've talked to several Christians and Ross is the first one who really understands what, you know, makes sense about what he believes. <laughs> Now, I'm, I'm not saying that to brag, I'm saying how sad it is that he talked to several other Christians who could not give a high school student any sort of reasonable explanation for why they were Christians. And people seem shocked when they meet Christians who actually seem to be able to think well. And that bugs me. Does that bother you? Okay, so we can help counter the impression. What's that? It's said they are on tablet. <laughs> yeah, you know, Paul talked about the milk versus the meat of the gospel. Yeah. Um, fifth, apologetics can help address the threat from false teaching and apostasy in the church. There is much false teaching. And our response to that not, it needs to be first biblical, but it also needs to be thoughtful. Sometimes we have to be prepared to present an argument in favor of what we believe is the true, true faith. And not give in to whatever you know, the authority structures or whoever else seems to be in the church. So we have a, all of us have a responsibility to keep the church in the right track on these things. Apologetics can help stem the rise of immorality. 
Studies have shown that among Christians, more than half of all Christians believe that whether something is right or wrong is dependent upon the circumstances. That's called situational ethics, and it is not Christian. And that sort of idea, you know, and then the extremes of that, of if it feels good, do it, or, you know, as long as you're not hurting anybody, what, you know, da 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 da. Uh, and on and on, apologetics, one of the tasks is for us to understand the the standards and values of the Christian faith in a way that we can... And you know what? The culture is crying out, whether they know it or not, for somebody to take a stand on issues mm -hmm. and say, that's not right. And the fact is that most of us Christians aren't doing it, and that's our job. Part of it is we need to be more confident before we'll do that. And apologetics can help you be more confident about your faith. Apologetics offers a Christian alternative to non-Christian thinking and influence that's dominant in our schools and larger society. With Christians not speaking up to say that's not, you know, that atheistic or agnostic you know, way of thinking of things is not the only alternative. Let me give you a sensible counter to that that is Christian. That's why people are speaking up about the new atheists. Yes, Greg. But, but I, just for what's happening right now on a lot of college campuses, you're just being hit with so much anti-Christian but but you 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 give a shot back or or get in, or want to get into a discussion, and and, and you, you're you're penalized. Oh yeah, that's true. I mean you you have no control. Yeah, I met a woman whose daughter was in Christopher Dawkins class in um, at Oxford, Oxford or Cambridge. I think it's Oxford. And um, anybody who would present anything that was not an atheistic approach, he would give them failing grades. Yeah. Doesn't matter how, how much they supported it, doesn't matter how valid their argument was, doesn't matter what sources they had, if they disagreed with him, he failed them. That was that movie, right? Yes. God, is not, oh, God is not dead. Mm. I've seen the title, I haven't seen it. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I remember my sister had that problem in college. And uh, she answered all the questions I had been taught to believe. Yeah. You know, not that she believed it. Right. Well, and I'm not saying this is easy, by the way. Yeah. I'm not saying that you're all going to walk out here today and you're going to be really effective and everybody's going to listen to you and everybody's going to believe all this stuff. If it was easy, then we wouldn't have to do it <laughs> um, because it would already be done. But the fact is we have to be prepared. We're not given a choice. You know, God didn't say, well, you know, if it's easy and you feel like it, then to give people an explanation for the faith that is in you. That's not part of that. We have to be prepared. And the difference... When you're confronted with somebody who is who is opposed to that, is it better to be prepared to respond or not to be prepared to respond? Given the you are going to be confronted, or at least you know you may be at the point where you you only you know you, you're not interacting with a lot of different groups that aren't Christian or whatever. But for people who are in the world still, who are still going to university, who are still involved in jobs or whatever, they're going to have situations, and you may they may be your your children or your friends or whatever. Um, they're going to be in situations where they still are going to be confronted with stuff. And it's much better to be prepared with a response when you're confronted than not to be. Don't really have a reasonable choice in that. Unless you just want to, you know. Okay, don't. Um, okay, how apologetics helps, specifically helps Christians. I think that apologetics helps us to know our faith better and how we can share it more effectively. We've talked a lot about this. Second, it can help us answer people's real questions. Christianity has spent far too much time answering questions nobody's asking. <laughs> the real questions people have, apologetics and a knowledge of scripture help us to answer those questions. And those often are the questions that hinder them from accepting the gospel. It allows us to have an influence in the public square, and by that I mean education, media, the common culture, public culture, etc. It allows us to prevent doct doctrinal apostasy within the church. It answers the false claims of cults and false religions. Now this, is, this overlaps, obviously intersects with that previous list I gave you. The previous list was overall, what does apologetics do? This is specifically how we as Christians can be helped by and how we can help other Christians through apologetics. So let's talk about what apologetics cannot do. Apologetics cannot prove beyond any doubt that God exists. But you know what? That's not the way to prove that anybody ever expect, expects in anything else. In a legal case, Ernest is an attorney, I don't know if anybody else is. Okay, Mike. 
The burden of proof in any legal situation, as it's accepted in the United States or Canada or any place else that has uh, that kind of legal system, is not that you prove beyond all doubt, it's that you prove beyond all reasonable doubt. <clears throat> Apologetics or nothing else is going to prove God beyond all doubt, but I believe it can prove the existence of God beyond any reasonable doubt. And that's the only burden of proof that we should be forced to stand up to. When somebody says, absolutely prove to me the existence of God, your response should be, I can't. Nobody can. But I can prove it to you beyond any reasonable doubt if you're willing to listen. Second, apologetics cannot prove beyond any possible doubt that Christianity and the Bible witness are true. Same thing. I can't prove it, but I can give sufficient evidence that it's a darn good argument for it, reason, beyond reasonable doubt. Third, it cannot argue people into the kingdom of God. That's not how it works. I have had people come up to me in classes before and say I have an aunt or a sister or a, you know, a niece, nephew that's not a Christian, and I have to do something to get them saved. What do I do? And I said, well, there is nothing you can do that is absolutely guaranteed because it's not up to you. You can pray for them. You can minister to them when they want you to. Force them into a corner and beat them about the head with a you know rolled up King James. They're not going to listen much. You can provide an example for them, and you can be prepared to listen and support them when they come to you with need. That's what you do, especially the pray part. You can't prove or you can't argue somebody into the kingdom of heaven. Apologetics can't do that. It can help pave the way. It can help reduce the defenses, lower the hurdles, answer the questions that people are focusing on to keep them from accepting, ultimately it is the job of the Holy Spirit to lead them into that faith. The fourth thing is, uh, apologetics will not take the place of the testimony of Scripture or the work of the Holy Spirit, which is related to those previous things. The Word of God is the Word of God. Apologetic arguments from C.S. Lewis or William Lane Craig or Josh McDell or R.C. Sproul or anybody else, they are not the Word of God. They are the Word of servants of God who are trying to support and encourage people in that direction, but they are not the divinely inspired, powerful, living Word of God that the Bible is. At some point, we rely on that. Nor do they take the place of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that touches. All we do is help facilitate the process in apologetics. And apologetics cannot ex exclusively replace biblical relational evangelism and discipleship. You can't stand at a distance and scream logical proofs of the existence of God at somebody and expect that you're going to effectively evangelize them or disciple them if they're already a believer or whatever. You've got to get in there. And it is their relationship with you more than anything else or other Christians that is going to have the most effect on them. But in the context of that relational kinds of evangelism and discipleship, you need to be prepared to explain what it is you believe in a way that makes sense. That's what apologetics is. And that's what we're studying in this course. Questions or comments? Florette? Well, uh, first thing is that uh, I believe the Holy Spirit has to knock and that the person will be ready for it then. And so I believe that we can actually chase people further away mm -hmm. at that time, mm -hmm. by, you know, pushing them at a time when they're not ready. Right. Um, and I forgot to say. Okay. Well, I, I don't disagree. In fact, when, when I'm saying we can't, when I say we can't argue people in the kingdom of God, etc., haranguing is not part of our job, you know, or nitpicking, or you know, uh, well, nagging. to be gentle. Maybe exactly. Gentle. The rest of that verse is, uh, you know, but do so with, you know, with gentleness and respect. We have to be gentle. We have to be respectful. We have to respond to people. That's the relational part. This is not a matter where we stand up, you know, high on our, um, our heels and scream truths at somebody. No matter how logically convincing they are, you expect that's going to do it. But the fact is that when the Holy Spirit knocks, many people's response to that is to say, Oh, I don't believe because the Bible is full of all these contradictions. I don't believe it because, you know, science has proven that God did not create the universe. You know, science has demonstrated that God can't possibly exist. And da 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 Those are frequently... The things people use to shield themselves from the approach of the Holy Spirit. And so our job, I believe, is in a relational, respectful, gentle way to help lower some of those shields 
so that when the Holy Spirit does approach, people are going to be more receptive to it. We don't do the actual work. And if we, if we do this badly, we can make it worse. We, our job is not to argue people into anything. It is to provide an alternative that makes sense to people. And nothing makes sense if you do it in an angry, aggressive way. The lead singer for the Dead Kennedys, punk group, once said, and I'm paraphrasing, if you rub cat crap in someone's face, the only thing you're going to prove to them is that they don't like cat crap. What does that mean, Ross? If in the process of telling anybody anything, you simply make them angry and offend them, they're not going to hear anything you have to say. And that's why gentleness and respect. We still have to have, be able to explain. We still have to be able to present the faith. We're told that's part of our job. But we do so gently. We don't make them angry. We don't rub their face in it. Because if we do, no matter how convincing we are, they're not going to buy it. Okay? Yes, ma'am. The world, and I don't mean everybody in it, but it seems that when I uh, get on the computer, it seems more and more people are accepting uh, things that, uh, when I was brought up, weren't weren't acceptable. Um, transgender uh, people that are gay. Um, churches are seeming to open the doors more, and even the Pope now has uh, opened his his doors to. What I'm just saying. careful about that. He hasn't actually. Well, he has expressed what I think is an appropriate Christian compassionate response without mm -hmm. saying it's okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt right. you. Well, even I've when, heard other people misread that, and right. I don't think and, he's gone there. And I, I probably was one of them, but even when he says it, I think it suddenly takes on the people take on the, oh, well, if he's <clears> saying <throat> it, maybe he's coming around. You know? Yes. <laughs> Um, yeah. But what I'm saying is, is that something in which is good that that churches are kind of accepting more that people have this situation? Are they are they wanting to accept that, hoping that there that people that come into a church that they can possibly change? I once had a gay friend, and he told me. When I tried to talk to him a little bit, he said, all my straight friends, including you, think I'm going to go to hell. I said, I, I would never tell you that because uh, that's not my judgment. On, on I don't, I'm not the, the judge right. of that. I'm just trying to explain what the Bible says. And right. you know and I know what it says. He's very, very unbelievably knowledgeable about the Bible and totally in denial. Okay. So, um, and unfortunately, he was horribly murdered. So I, I don't know about what that's all about, okay. but anyway, um, what I'm saying is that is that the way things should be going that we should all well that's to... that's a huge question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let me let me tell you my perspective on um, on and this would cover several things. The most the most specific one would be um, the practicing active practicing of a homosexual lifestyle which is a different issue than having homosexual desires, okay? I have all kinds of desires. Given an opportunity, I would likely rape and pillage, but I don't do that, and so the fact that I'm inclined in that direction is not a sin, necessarily. Um, so let's make sure we understand the difference between having a desire and, and fulfilling that desire in a lifestyle. Almost every church these days takes one of two routes, and they're the two easy paths. Either they say, that all expressions of, of sexuality are fine, whatever they are, and, and if the Bible says you shouldn't, then either we just don't understand it, or progressive revelation means that no longer holds, or all kinds of explanations, but everything's fine. And sort of forget what the Bible really says. That's easy. That's easy to do. In fact, everybody pat you on the back if you do that. On the other hand, there are the churches that say that, that stand up and in nine seconds say, anybody who practices homosexuality is going to hell. Now let's pray. <laughs> Neither of those is what Jesus told us. Jesus, I believe, told us that there is a narrow way in this regard where we both are compassionate and welcoming to people who have desires and motivations and lifestyles that we feel are not biblical. Homosexuality, transgender, there was um, a transvestite, a man 
you know, dressed as a woman who came to our church once, Carolyn and I, times. a couple times. We found out later this person had been told in other churches in our community, don't ever come back. We greeted this person, we shook their hands, we welcomed them, told them, hope they'd, you know, that they'd make this their church home. If they didn't have this person, this, this, uh, if they didn't have a church home, made this their church home. That didn't mean we were saying we agree with whatever sexual decisions or motivations or desires that person had. I would like nothing better, given the fact that we have a large homosexual community here at Lakeside, I would love nothing better than 10 or 20 or 30 percent of our congregation be gays and lesbians. I would welcome them. That doesn't, that's not the same, because Jesus welcomed sinners. That is not the same thing as saying I approve of that lifestyle choice. And people say, well, you know, this is who I am, this is what I'm motivated by. That's never been an excuse for action in history. Because you wanted to do something, or you felt drawn, you felt moved to do something, or you felt motivated to do something, doesn't make everything okay. Well, this person made me so angry, you know, I just, it was, a, I couldn't help myself, I just had to kill him. That's not considered, you know, just because you really feel strongly you have to do something, is not, and, and the idea that sexual fulfillment is the end-all and be-all of a person's personhood has never until the last half of the 20th century been accepted as a real argument. It has always been sensed that, that in all kinds of ways, sexuality being one of them, that just because you desire something doesn't mean it's the right thing. G.K. Chesterton said, not all desires are desirable. And again, I'm saying I have all kinds of desires that are not desirable. And, I, and just because I desire them doesn't mean I can do them and be okay with that. Now, that's, I'm getting confusing here. To me, the narrow middle way is the right Christian way, in which we welcome people wherever they are. We introduce them to Jesus. We share the Word of God with them. That doesn't mean that we say every lifestyle choice that they make is okay. We neither take the easy path of saying, whatever you want to do, express yourself sexually or in any other way is fine. doesn't matter what the Bible says. That's easy. Nor is it everybody who acts this way, particular way, is going to go to hell, you know, past the plate. That's easy. The hard way, and, you know, if we ever do get a large percentage of people in Lakeside Presbyterian Church who are gay or lesbian, gay and or lesbian, it's going to lead to problems. As a pastor, I should probably should wish that that would never happen because it's going to lead to all kinds of problems when people start asking hard questions of me as the pastor. Mm -hmm. But I don't have a choice. Jesus said, welcome the sinners. Don't tell them their sin is okay. You remember Jesus, the woman caught in adultery, brought to Jesus, and they were going to stone her. And they asked Jesus, Rabbi, what do you think? And he said, well, the, the one of you who is without sin cast the first stone. And then he knelt down and writing in the dirt. One by one, they turned and walked away. Mm -hmm. And when they were all gone, Jesus looked up and he said, woman, where are your accusers? And she said, they left. And he said, well, neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. Mm -hmm. He did not drive her away. He did not advocate killing her. He did not condemn her, but he also didn't say what she was doing was okay. Go okay. and sin no more. And so, to me, that's the Christian response. That's the hard one. But that's the response. We in the church today, as, as Christians, as people who really believe the word, the, uh, the Bible is the word of God, cannot just say everything society is saying is okay is okay. Carl mm -hmm. Barth said we should uh, read the newspaper and interpret it based upon what we find in the Bible. Too many people today read the Bible and interpret upon what they find in the newspaper. What is society saying is okay and acceptable? You can't do that. Barbara? But you're implying that homosexuality is a lifestyle choice, and it's not. Well, the choice that's, to... That's the problem I'm having, is, yeah. is that God created them. We now know that it's not, oh, it's just a whim. No, I know that. They were born this way. But the decision to practice that lifestyle is a decision. Mm -hmm. The motive, That's why I say we draw a clear distinction between the motivation, the desire, and the actual practicing of it. The Bible does not say that having homosexual desires is a sin. It says practicing homosexuality is a sin. And it does say that. Not just in the Old Testament, it says it in the New Testament. Read the first two chapters of Romans. You know, and it's very clear. And I don't, I wish it weren't in there. 
It would make my life so much easier if it wasn't there, but it is. And I can't pick and choose what parts of that I agree with and accept. Now, what I'm saying is a compassionate, I believe in a compassionate response without sacrificing what we believe is the true rule of faith, which is the Bible. And there is, you know, Alistair McGrath has got a really good book called Welcoming But Not Affirming. Mm -hmm. But it is, it is modern society that has told us that all of that's acceptable. I, I would say we do not, we always differentiate, we do not condemn people for what they desire. But when they choose to live a lifestyle like that, then that is a life choice. That is a lifestyle decision. Okay? Um, Stan? No, I was going to say there's a pretty good author up there that addresses this stuff besides the one you mentioned. It's Michael Brown. Okay. He's a uh, Jewish American pastor, actually. Mm -hmm in New York City, and he deals with this head on. If they just Google Michael Brown and homosexuality, uh, you'll find all kinds of interviews with him or the beats, okay. that kind of stuff. But he deals with it like in a very gentle manner okay. and with a lot of love. He doesn't take the uh, Westboro or Baptist Church <laughs> or stuff down. Uh, <laughs> the Lord's going to have something to say about them. Okay, okay. <laughs> we're already 10, 10 minutes over. I'm going to take it real quick. Not, not very long. I always think when I'm confronted with these conundrums, which are really big and, and can be very hurtful to ourselves or to others. If this were my child who was the murderer or the, uh, the assailant or the homosexual, would I hate them? Would I discriminate against them? No, I would love them and care for them and um, right. honor their personhood but not their practice. Right, you know? I, exactly, and, and, and that's so, what I'm saying. Yeah, we have, have to have to, compassion, we have to have... It's tough. Yeah, um, just, okay, just all one right. really quick comment. I believe that if we're going to say that their lifestyle isn't right, we have to be equally in the agreement that two people, that heterosexual people that are living together are equal to those people that are having their sexual practices that are homosexual. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. It's, we're not selecting sins, they're acceptable. Yeah. Some of you who are in our church have heard me say that people who buy DVDs in front of uh, Super Late are sinning because you are purchasing stolen material. You are participating in a theft. And that's not okay. We will not use songs in our, in our the reason we have to have hymnals is because we can't use songs legally uh, broadcasting the lyrics if we've not purchased the rights to them. You can't purchase rights of that kind down here, but if we buy the hymnals, it's legal and appropriate for us to use the songs and projected thing. We're very, we are very clear on that. We had a young man not long after Carolyn and I started here at this church who was a very talented musician. He wanted to lead worship for us on a regular basis. Um, I Somebody mentioned to me and I uh, that he, the woman he was living with who called his wife with whom he had one child, they had an older child, was not his wife. In fact, she, in fact, she was married to somebody else. And so I went with Arturo Smith, who was then our pastor of the Spanish language congregation. We met with this young man, and I said, is, you know, is it true that you're not married? And he said, yeah, you know, she wants to get a divorce, but it's difficult and expensive and everything else. I said, as long as that is your situation, I cannot have you involved in leading worship. You're welcome in our church. We love you. We love your wife. We love your kids. We want you there. But I can't have you in a leadership role as long as that's your situation. And I said, and while I don't like divorce, I don't advocate divorce, it's a better alternative than where you are right now. And if you say she wants that, weird as it sounds, can we help? It, can we refer you to an attorney? Can we assist you? We offer to provide like weekly counseling for them as a couple and do whatever we could to, to help resolve that matter. Rather than just say, get out of here. Now, Trying to be compassionate, but still believing that the Bible gives us truths that we can't equivocate about. It's hard, but that's where we find ourselves. We're over time, 10 minutes. I'm sorry. It's your fault. <laughs>